January 15, 1978, Blenheim House Hotel, North Berwick, Scotland. The hotel proprietor is suspicious about two new guests. When he's worried that they won't be able to pay their bill, he telephones the local police asking them to run the registration plates on their car. When the plates didn't match the vehicle, police bring them in for questioning. What they didn't know was that there was a dead body in the trunk of that car, and it wasn't the first, but the fifth that had been inside the boot. This is a story about a thief and a liar who rubbed elbows with the wealthy and famous. He was also a delusional, sex-addicted murderer. This is Archibald Hall, a.k.a. Roy Fontaine. The butler did it. Hey, y'all, I'm Chris Calvert. And I'm her husband, Rob Potworth. Welcome to Hitch to Homicide. For better or worse. Till death do us part. everybody yes welcome 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 and for our friends in punjabi <laughs> okay <laughs> you ready Punjab, for yeah yep, yep it's swagate 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 there you go yeah very nice that's over there in india <laughs> it is over there in india yeah and we have a connection because we have a woman who is indian born in this true crime case ah Am I that good? You are that telepathic. <laughs> we share a brain. And by the way, uh, we do have some questions that I'm always holding Scotty most of the time during the beginning of the show. And it's because he has to be held and he has to have all the attention. He's a, he's an attention whore. Yeah, so <laughs> in order for him not to be barking while we're trying to record, I've got to hold him every He eventually time. gets worn out. He gets bored of us yeah. and then he's he's out of here. But. He goes back to his bed here yeah. on the couch behind me. Yeah. So. For sure. Okay, there you go. Well, wherever you are listening, be sure to like, rate, and review the podcast. You can subscribe wherever you're listening. And if you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button below. Yep. You can find us on Instagram at Hitch to Homicide or on X at H2H underscore podcast. And if you want true crime with us every single day of the week, please go join our closed Facebook group, The In-Laws and Outlaws. The family. Go to Facebook and type in H2H In-Laws and Outlaws. Answer a few questions and you're in. So go join. It's a lot of fun. Yep. Lots of good people in there. <laughs> they really are. We're getting case suggestions and true crime listener stories. Keep them coming. Yes. We appreciate everyone who listens each week and takes the time to send us a note or an email or a, a smoke direct signal message or, whatever. or a, yeah, a smoke <laughs> signal from somewhere. Yeah. We may just do a whole podcast of people's brushes with true crime. Yeah. This case is very interesting. I read about this a long time ago. There are a couple of books. I read one of them. Really interesting. We're going across the pond. Hopefully I don't butcher too many names today. <laughs> I'm sure someone will love to send me an email. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to tell me how bad I did. But I did look them all up, so I'm going to try my best. It's like uh, my good friend Andrew and his family live over in Berkshire. And here in the United States, we would look at it and say, oh, you live in Berkshire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Before we get started, let me thank some sources. The Watford Observer, Glasgow Live. See, I didn't call it Glasgow. Mm -hmm. Real Crimes, The Haunting Murders of Archibald Hall, Murderpedia, Wikipedia, JakeBones.com, The Scotsman, The Free Library, The Washington Post, Crime and Investigations, and The Wicked Mr. Hall. Memoirs of the Butler Who Loved to Kill by Roy Archibald Hall, the man we're talking about today. Wow. He wrote two books. <laughs> wow. Well, you ready? Nope. Okay, well, we're I've just home. always wanted to say that because <laughs> I always say I am. <laughs> okay, let's do it. 
Archibald Thompson Hall is born on July 17, 1924 in Govan, which is a part of Glasgow, Scotland. Okay. His parents were working class. His father was a postman, and he was the oldest of three. He was named after his dad. He didn't like that too much. Really? He wanted not to be called Archibald or Archie, but Roy. Hmm. And because he's Archie in some sources and he's Roy in other sources, I don't want to confuse anybody, and I'm just going to refer to him as Roy, okay? okay. All right. His parents were guilty of not co-parenting. What does that mean? Um, it means his mom would undermine what his father would say to Roy a lot. Uh-huh. She would indulge her oldest son. So if he said no, if dad said no... Then mom was like, okay, here's what we're going to do because I want you to have everything that you want, Roy. And she did it a lot, and she's going to cover for him a lot. I do want to tell you this true crime has different details depending on which source you use, and I will do my best to give you as many versions of the story as I can because the one version that is the most interesting is obviously from the killer himself. Mm. But I started off the podcast by telling you he was a liar. Yeah, okay. So take some of it with a grain of salt. I'll tell you if it's from Roy himself. Okay. Now, from the time Roy is a little kid, he is mesmerized by the silver screen of 1940s Hollywood. Oh, really? He saw these actors on the screen and stories of the wealthy and the famous, and that's the life he wanted for himself. Mm. And in order to do this, he needed to figure out a way to make money. Sure. Now, he's a smart kid, and he learns how to be a con man Mm. from a very early age. Wow. He knows he's not going to make money being a postman like his father. Sure. So he starts stealing. He would watch really nice houses. He'd look through the windows, and he kept track of the comings and goings of the people who live there so he could rob them when no one was home. Wow. Now, by the time he's 15, he's in trouble for stealing. One of his greatest schemes was working for the Red Cross. Really? Well, he would do collections, and this is the way it would work. The tin had, like, two different pails. One was for change, and one was for paper money. Gotcha. And all the change went to the Red Cross, <laughs> and all the paper money went into Roy's, Roy's pocket. Yeah, yeah. Now, the empty houses he was robbing when families were away was where he was getting jewelry and antiques. Mm. He's stealing from them in Scotland and trying to sell them in London. Uh. And in 1941, this is exactly what happens when he's caught by the police after stealing jewelry from a home and trying to sell it. He's sent not to prison, but to a psychiatric unit where they basically say he's mentally unstable. Really? Yeah. And what I took from that was possibly two things. That he was delusional, he was living in his own head where everything was a Hollywood story. Mm -hmm. Because he did tell people, he did tell the authorities the stuff that he had stolen was worth like a half a million pounds. And it was worth like a thousand pounds. Gotcha. Or what I haven't told you yet is that Roy is bisexual. Mm. And he has quite the sexual appetite. And he wants to pretend that his life is glamorous and that he possesses this sexual magnetism that people just cannot resist. (laughs) Okay. And quite frankly, there are a lot of old, dirty men in London who don't resist him as a young boy. Now, he's going to spend the next 10 years in psychiatric units, but while he's there, he starts studying. He's studying etiquette and elocution. Speech, elocution, and poise. He studied and learned all about the aristocracy, and he worked on losing his Scottish accent, trading it in for a refined English accent. Gotcha. And Archibald Hall officially transformed himself into Roy Fontaine. (laughs) Oh, wow. There's a Hollywood name. Well, remember, he wanted to be called Roy when he was a kid. Right. Because he didn't like his first name. But he chose Fontaine because of... Joan Fontaine. Ah, okay. He loved Alfred Hitchcock's movie, Rebecca, mm. and Joan Fontaine played that role. He's dead. That's what we got to remember. Rebecca's... Ah, that's right, yeah. And Alfred Hitchcock's... <laughs> and he was always in his movies. <laughs> he was. And who does that now? Uh, I don't know. M. Night Shyamalan. Oh, he that's right. He puts himself in all his movies, yeah, yeah, just yeah. like Hitchcock. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. 
but he doesn't have. No, he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't. <laughs> All right. Roy changes his Glaswegian accent and he becomes this refined gentleman because he knows if he's going to walk the walk of a gentleman, he's got to talk the talk too. Sure. And he learns from everything and everyone around him. When his mother is employed as a housekeeper, what he learns is that this position came with a great deal of trust on the part of the employer. And the male version of a housekeeper is? But a butler, under butler, footman, a valet. A butler. A butler. Yeah. Being a butler would give him access to wealthy people and in turn access to their possessions and quite possibly their bank accounts too. Mm. He can use the position as a butler to steal from his employees and... People who employ a butler have money, so he'll be living and working around wealth, which is what he wants. Yeah. So when he's released into society, he goes by the name Roy Fontaine. He's a con man, a jewel thief. He would see an expensive ring in a jewelry shop and have a fake of that ring made. Then he would go back to that jewelry shop and ask to see the real ring And while the jeweler isn't looking, he would switch the ring he paid maybe a hundred pounds for, for a ring worth thousands of pounds. Wow, that's a pretty good scam. He would then take that ring to another city and sell it, saying it was a rare antique that he was given by his grandmother. Right. So stealing is his favorite crime. Mm -hmm. He was a pretty good con man. He will, over the years, according to him, mingle with the rich and famous of England. Right. People like composer Ivor Novello. Ivor Novello was a Welsh actor, dramatist, singer, and composer who became one of the most popular British entertainers of the first half of the 20th century. Really? He was also, according to him, friends with Lord Mountbatten. Louis Francis Albert Victor Nicholas Mountbatten is part of UK's prominent Battenberg family. He's the maternal uncle to the late Prince Philip and a second cousin to King George VI. (laughs) Okay. And finally, Roy writes about the fact that he is really close to playwright Terence Radigan. Sir Terence Radigan was a celebrated British playwright famous for The Winslow Boy, The Browning Version, The Deep Blue Sea, and Separate Tables. He wrote a number of plays which centered on issues of sexual frustration, failed relationships, and a world of repression. Hmm. According to Roy, he had a rip-roaring love affair with Terence, and Terence introduced him to people like Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, whom he found terribly dull. (laughs) Except for the fact that he loved the diamond ring on Elizabeth Taylor's finger. I'm sure he did. Which was the 33.19 carat Asher cut diamond. It's called the Krupp diamond. It's a nearly flawless stone. And when Roy shook or kissed Elizabeth Taylor's hand, he got the tingles. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I'm getting tingles. Just got tingles from head to toe. (laughs) Wow. In 1964, he goes back to prison for stealing jewelry and would serve another 10 years. At least he would have, except he escaped from prison. Okay. When he escapes, he meets a girl named Margaret. She was from Dublin. And when they meet, Margaret, who he gives the last name of Phillips to in his book, is two months pregnant. Mm. She's 20. He is 41. Wow. He likes Margaret, and Margaret loves him. Mm. These two get a home together at Paddock Wood in Kent, and he takes on the name Roy Phillips this time. Really? Now, these two really loved watching a show that was popular at the time called The Fugitive. Oh, yeah. That's blatant foreshadowing. (laughs) Not even going to whisper it. That's foreshadowing. He loved the show The Fugitive. Let's do a little foreshadowing music. Yep. (laughs) So Margaret gives birth to a baby girl. They name her Caroline. I did read where Margaret confessed to Roy that the baby belonged to an Irish police officer. Okay. And she was like, does that bother you? And he was like, as long as it doesn't bother you that I've escaped jail. (laughs) But police track down Roy and they take him back to prison. And he's sentenced with another five years on top of the sentence he was supposed to be serving already. Wow. 
Margaret goes to live with his mother after he's taken back to prison, and she would visit him, but eventually Roy tells her to find someone who will really love her and the baby, and she leaves crying, Mm. and according to him, eventually her letter stopped, but then she showed up to visit him one day, and she said, I've found a man who loves me and the baby, and I'm immigrating to Canada. Okay. That was the end of her. Lucky for her. Luckiest thing that ever happened to her. Yeah. Then Roy falls in love. He falls in love with an inmate whose name is Dave Barnard. Dave had been in prison for 12 years, and these two are head over heels in love. Roy will say this is the only time he has ever truly been in love. Well, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. When he's released... He's put into this probation place where they would give him a job and a place to live, kind of like a halfway house. He called it a hostel. Hmm. He starts working at Whittingham Hospital for the Insane as a kitchen porter. And the first day on the job, he meets Mary Coggle. Mary was a sex worker they called Belfast Mary. Okay. Roy starts sleeping with her, and he decides he's going to use her as a go-between him and Dave. Because ex-inmates are not allowed to go back to the prison to visit. Gotcha. So Mary would go and visit Dave for him and smuggle in letters and presents, that kind of thing. Sure. Now, while Roy is working at the hospital and he's still living in this hostel, this halfway house, there's a newsstand across the street that was run by a woman named Hazel Patterson. Okay. She was the widow of a Lancashire publisher and Hazel had money. So, to Roy, Dave was love, Mary was sex, and Hazel was money. Okay. Mary the mule, and then Hazel the, (laughs) I don't know. The bag lady? Yeah, exactly. Well, he's also sleeping with Hazel. Oh, wow. And Mary, Belfast Mary. Yeah. And according to him, he was also sleeping with a young chef named Tony who worked at the hospital. Good grief. He's also having an affair with a woman from Blackpool who just happens to be his half-brother's girlfriend. Man, I need a program. I told you. He likes sex. He sleeps around. Yeah. But he works with Hazel, and he sells her shop for her. She wants to get rid of the shop. He sells it. He negotiates this. And when he does, she buys him a Jaguar. Jaguar. (laughs) A car. Yeah. And she opens a joint checking account. Between the two of them. Why would she do that? Because she's not thinking straight. Yeah. But he tires of Hazel, and he cleans out the account and leaves for London, where he's been meeting on the weekends a woman named Ruth Holmes. Surprise, surprise, surprise. (laughs) Ruth works for a huge fashion house in London, and she has her own money. Now, he still loves Dave, who's back at prison, Mm -hmm. but he fell in love with Ruth, the one and only woman he will ever love. Okay. He marries Ruth and moves in with her into her big old Hammersmith flat and starts working as a butler to Angelo Southall. Okay. Ruth has no idea who or what Roy has done in the past. She thinks he's a businessman. Mm. And when she asks questions, he just sort of brushes it all off. So Ruth, his new wife, doesn't know that her husband was in a parole house and working at a mental hospital and that there's this woman named Hazel who he stole from. And she didn't know about Mary, who was still seeing Dave in prison for him. Is that clear enough? Clear as mud? Yeah, it sort of reminds me of The Wedding Singer when Adam Sandler's talking to his ex fiance. Yes. And he's saying... It would have been nice if you would have told me this yesterday. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, eventually, Ruth does find out about Dave, about him loving Dave. Okay. And when she does, Roy feels pretty bad about lying to this woman he loves, to which I say, dude, you are sleeping with and stealing from everybody. You're not sorry for Dave. (laughs) You're sorry your wife, Ruth, found out about Dave. You're just a sorry person. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And Ruth wants answers, and according to Roy's autobiography, he told her everything about Dave and their love and their sexual relationship. Wow. Now, every time Roy is in and out of prison or he's escaped, he maintains a relationship with this, like, underground network of 
other thieves. Okay. Some of them, I'm sure, are also murderers. Right. And one of them calls him and says, I'm working for this guy, and he's left a briefcase full of important papers, and it seems like I should do something with this. It's worth something, but I can't pick the lock. Hmm. So he calls Roy. Roy meets him, gets the briefcase. He takes it to another guy who was like his father in the first stay in prison. His name is John Wooten. And John has met Roy's mother before. Somewhere in here, Roy's mom and dad have divorced. But John and Roy's mom fall in love. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. So this guy that he met that kind of fathered him in prison. Right. He gets out, meets Roy's mom, and those two fall in love. And now he really is his father. Yeah. And I only tell you this because John is really a father figure to Roy. And he's someone that he absolutely trusts like no other. Gotcha. Except for maybe his mom. Okay. So Roy gives these papers to John to copy. Now, it's unclear to me if he ever gave the briefcase back to the guy who called him about it in the first place. But when all of this goes down, Roy is in the middle of these very official government papers. And the police figure out who he is, and now he's going back to prison. Oh, man. Now, apparently, Ruth knows a very good attorney, a a solicitor, Mm -hmm. and Roy meets with him and basically says, I can blackmail all these guys and the government because I know which underage boys each of these men have been sleeping with. Oh, man. Yeah. Wow. He wants to blackmail them. That's a dangerous game. So he goes back to prison again, and he tells Ruth, just divorce me because you deserve somebody to love you like she loves him. Mm -hmm. Now, Mary Coggles is still taking stuff to Roy's true love Dave in prison for him because he still loves Dave very much. But when he gets into prison this time, he meets a guy named David Wright, a young 20-something who's good-looking and just loves to sleep with Roy. (laughs) So these two are getting it on in Long Larton Prison in Worcestershire. I love that on my burgers, too. (laughs) Sorry. And meanwhile, it's 1973. Your jokes, honey. I love them. (laughs) But I'm bumped. Thank you. It's 1973, and Dave Barnard, the real love of Roy's life, is now out of prison. Okay. But Roy's in prison. Right. And Roy has Mary, Belfast Mary, meet Dave at the prison gates to give him Roy's car, the Jaguar, the Jaguar that Hazel had bought for him. Wow. So Dave starts visiting Roy in prison, the lovebirds. They're such Mm lovebirds. But tragedy strikes in the spring of 1974 when Dave is out driving the Jag and he crashes on the highway and dies. Oh, wow. Roy will say that he never recovers from this. Mm. In June of 1975, just months after Dave dies in the car crash, Roy's mother dies of cancer. He's gutted and his now stepfather and best friend slash father figure John is also gutted. When he's released from prison, he goes to live with John in Lytham. He calls Ruth and asks if he can visit her. He's really distraught, and he goes to London to see her, and one thing leads to another, and these two end up in bed. And while these two are doing the wild thing, Roy shouts out Dave's name. (laughs) Dave! Dave? (laughs) Oops. And that, folks, is the end of the relationship between (laughs) Roy and Ruth. I don't understand why. So apparently she can take it if he's been sleeping with another man and is in love with him. But if you shout out his name (laughs) while you're making love to me, we done. There are limits and there's a line (laughs) in the sand. That must have been one of them. I can't take it anymore. There are limits to what a woman can take. (laughs) In 1975, he's out of prison, and he leaves England to go back to Scotland, conning his way through various butler jobs. He cons his way into a job working as a butler to a wealthy widow named Lady Margaret. She goes by Peggy Hudson. All right. He sees an advertisement in the newspaper, an advertisement. Sorry, let me... (laughs) <laughs> talking about a proper gentleman. He sees an advertisement in the paper... And it's in a secluded part of Scotland, a place called Kirkleton House. Okay. 
Lady Hudson was the widow of Sir Austin Hudson, a conservative member of Parliament. And Peggy liked him. Lady Hudson liked him because he was smart. He was knowledgeable as a butler. He acted the part. And he was willing to work for lower wages than the average butler. Mm. Now, Lady Hudson actually found Roy through an agency and she got a reference for him from a Mr. Wooten, who is John Wooten, Roy's stepfather. Mm-hmm. So it's all part of the ruse. Okay. And all he said was, he's a businessman. Yeah. Got it. He's been a businessman. He's a great, he's a great butler. Okay. When he's employed there, he really likes it at Kirkleton House. He really likes being there. It's far away from people. He basically has run of the house. His room and board are included. And he's working for 20 pounds a week, which was on the low end, like I said, of what a butler would make. Right. But he liked Kirkleton House. He was always swimming in the swimming pool or walking in the gardens. He could shoot skeet or hunt. She allows him to drive any of her cars, including a Rolls Royce. Wow. And he formed a tight relationship with Tessa. Who's Tessa? Lady Hudson's Labrador Retriever. No. <laughs> <laughs> he can't be all bad if he loves the dog. Yeah, yeah. Now, according to Roy, Lady Hudson was a bit of a drinker. And she would hit on him. And Roy being Roy and the sex addict that he seems to be, right. he sleeps with Lady Hudson. He says, out of pity. And how old was Roy at this time? Um, He's late 40s. Okay. Late 40s, early 50s. All yeah. Right. All right. But he's still a jewel thief at heart. Mm -hmm. He knows every piece of jewelry that Lady Hudson owned. He knew them. He could count them. He knew where they were stored. And he could resign his position and then go back and steal her jewelry, which was his M.O. from times past. Sure. But he liked living where he was, and he didn't know if he wanted to steal anything. Yeah, he had he, a good thing going. Yeah, he'd been in jail for a really long time. He didn't want to go back. Right. But while he works at Kirkleton House, he keeps in touch with his stepdad, John, who tells him that David Wright, the young 20-something that he slept with, mm -hmm. is now out of prison and is looking for him. Gotcha. So John gives David Roy's information, and David shows up in Scotland at Kirkleton House. Now, Roy lies and tells Lady Hudson that David is just out of a 10-year stint in the Army, and she invites him to stay and work for room and board on the estate. I read in one source that he managed the pheasants. Oh, wow. He was like the game manager on the property. Gotcha. I mean, it really is kind of like lifestyles of the, yeah, the wealthy. Rich, yeah. yeah. Lifestyles of the rich and famous. Well, they're not very famous, but they're rich and titled and they all have land in England. Lifestyles of the rich and not famous. <laughs> rich and titled or maybe entitled, yeah. right? Yep. Now, David and Roy are back to having sex again while living at Kirkleton House. Surprise, okay. surprise. Yeah. But David wants to rob Lady Hudson's house, and Roy does not. Mm. And when Roy pushes back on this, David sort of tries to blackmail Roy by saying, she doesn't know who you are. She doesn't know who you really are. And yeah. I do. Don't make me out you. Uh -oh. And so he actually kind of blackmails Roy, and Roy pay some money to him. Hmm. But when Roy is inventorying Lady Hudson's jewelry, remember he knows where everything is, he notices that a diamond ring is gone. Hmm. So he goes to David's room and he searches through his drawers and finds it in David's sock drawer. I'm like, is this a movie? I yeah. mean, where do you keep it? <laughs> the sock drawer. <laughs> and Roy's furious with David. And these two argue, and again, David threatens to out Roy. But instead, he leaves in a huff and goes to a pub where he proceeds to get wasted. Now, Lady Hudson is out of town when all of this is going on. Okay. When David comes home that night after drinking what I read was six bottles of champagne, I don't know how he's walking home. Good Lord. Uh. He throws open the door to Roy's room and fires a gun, missing Roy but hitting the headboard. 
Wow. He must have been drunk. So it's a good thing Lady Hudson's out of town, obviously, right? Yeah, because yeah. there are guns going off in the house. Sure. But after the gun goes off, David tells Roy, quote, we're robbing tonight, end quote. Mm. And these two struggle, and then David cries, and Roy takes the gun away from him. And David leaves and goes to sleep off the booze. But Roy is thinking in his mind, I'm going to kill you, David. Mm. The next day, David comes to Roy and apologizes. I'm so sorry. I don't know what came over me. And Roy is like, hey, no big deal. Listen, my stepdad John's coming in today because Lady Hudson's gone. We're going to go hunting if you want to join us. <laughs> and John actually doesn't. His stepdad actually doesn't show up that day. All right. But when Roy and David leave, Roy knows David has eight rounds of ammo. Mm. So he counts David's shots as they're hunting. And when he gets to eight, Roy asks him, is your gun empty? And David says, yes. And Roy says, quote, I don't want you trying to kill me again, end quote. Wow. Now, Roy says he gave this big speech while holding a gun to David's head. But most people who know this story say that it's more likely that David turned his back on Roy because he shot him in the back of the head. Ooh. And when he fell, Roy said his eyes were still open, so he shot him again in the chest. Wow. And again. And again. I think he was dead the first time. Yeah. He drags the body to the bushes. He goes back to the house and gets a shovel. But the ground is really hard and frozen. So he takes off David's clothes. He strips him of his ID. He weighs him down with some rocks. He puts him in a nearby stream. He goes by every day to check on the body. And he takes with him the Labrador Retriever. Yeah. Because he wants to see if the dog can detect the odor of the body decomposing. He wants to see if Tessa walks past the yeah. dead body. Yeah. He's thinking this whole thing through. He really is. And every time he goes to check on the body, he does a little something different. He adds more brush or he adds this or he throws mud on top of him. So he's really, he's working on his crime scene. Wow. When his stepdad, John, comes to visit, Roy takes him to the area where he has buried David and he asks John... Do you know, can you tell that there's a body buried right around here? Wow. And John is like sitting on the ground and he says, I, I can't see anything. Am I close? And Roy is like, you are three feet away hmm. from where David Wright is buried. Wow. Now, when Lady Hudson comes home, Roy tells her that David took a new job and left without saying goodbye. <laughs> but David isn't Roy's problem. Because Hazel Patterson has called Lady Hudson. Remember, Hazel owned the newspaper shop who Roy was sleeping with. He yeah. helped her sell the shop. She bought him the Jag. Right. Set up the joint checking account that he cleared out. Yeah, that Hazel. Okay. She outs Roy to Lady Hudson saying he's a jewel thief who's been in jail a lot. Wow. And Lady Hudson calls the policeman and asks for them to run a background check. And Lady Hudson promptly lets Roy Fontaine go from his butler position and has him escorted off the property by the police. Wow. So Roy returns to London where he became the butler for the Scott Elliots. Okay. You'd think that somebody'd be like, mm, this is bad news, but he's go he's leaving Scotland and going to England, going to London. So he didn't have any kind of record that he could get arrested again. No. Okay. No, he'd he'd served his time. Okay, okay. He you know, he he escaped, right. but then they caught him, took him back. He got an extra five years. I gotcha. He served all that time. That's and when he got out was when he started working for yeah, I just wasn't had, sure when they escorted him off of the premises that he didn't have some sort of warrant or something. No, okay. they're just like, get out. <laughs> get out. It's like um, Eddie Murphy in yeah. uh, Trading Places. Get the f out. Get <laughs> out. <laughs> ah, I love that scene. So he's going to be a butler again for the Scott Elliots. It's now November of 1977. Walter Scott Elliott was an 82-year-old member of the House of Commons, and his second wife, Dorothy, is an Indian-born aristocrat who is 22 years younger than he is. Okay. Walter's first wife was an Austrian baroness. These people have real yeah. money. 
These are the blue bloods. He was educated at Eton. He's the son of a Scots landowner, an ex-captain in the Coldstream Guards who saw action in the Great War. Wow. She was the daughter of a rich Calcutta merchant. They lived quietly in their penthouse apartment with their collection of Indian antiques and jewelry. My dad was a photographer. <laughs> <laughs> Roy always has his eye out for valuables. And what he notices is that this house is chock full of valuable antiques and jewelry. Oh, yeah. This is the big one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, folks. This is a big one. Yeah. <laughs> and Roy is thinking, if I can pull this job, I can retire for the rest of my life. And the Scott Elliots, it's hyphenated, by the way. Okay. They're very wealthy. They had lots of bank accounts around the world. They had homes around the world, and they owned homes all over Britain. And Roy couldn't be happier. <laughs> now, you might be thinking, how in the world did he get a job working for these high-profile people after he's been dismissed by Lady Hudson? Yeah. Well, this is London. She's in Scotland. Mm. And apparently, from everything I read, he was such a good con man that it was easy for him to pull anything off. Yeah. But he looks the part. He acts the way he's supposed to. He's very refined. Sure. He's a good butler. Yeah. Now that he's back in London, he sees Mary Coggle again, Belfast Mary, as she's known. Mary the Mule. And funny thing, Mary used to work in the kitchen for the Scott Elliots. <laughs> Wow. He meets up with her in a bar, and she just happens to be chatting with a man named Michael Kitto. Mike Kitto had been to prison three times for mostly petty crime. But between the three of them, they devise a plan to rob the Scott Elliots. By the way, by this time, he was already stealing from the flat, including 67 silver Edward I pennies. Oh, wow. Now, Walter's older, as I already told you. He's 82, and he suffers from a little bit of dementia. So when Dorothy, his wife, had to go into a nursing home for a few days, Walter was at home with Roy. Mm -hmm. On the evening of the 8th of December, Roy took the opportunity to show Mike Kiddo around the Scott Elliott's house. And these two had been drinking. And I had had a few cocktails. Stop! You know, they're like, he's, she's gone. Yeah. He doesn't know where he is. Yeah. Let's go have a few cocktails. I'm sure they were drinking beers, whatever. Get a couple cocktails in me. <laughs> and they go back to this house. Now, in one source, it said that they actually raided the wine cellar. But unbeknownst to Roy, Mrs. Scott Elliott had returned home earlier that day. Oh. And when he opened the door to the Scott Elliott's bedroom, he expected to see the old 82-year-old man asleep, but was confronted by Dorothy, oh. who wanted to know, what are you doing here yeah, yeah. with a stranger in my house? <laughs> oh, man. And that ain't no Ronnie Millsap tune either. <laughs> There's a stranger in my... Sorry. <laughs> this is why I keep you around. I know. <laughs> <laughs> These two panic... They just panic when she's like, what are you doing here? They grab her, and then they use a pillow, and they suffocate her. Oh, wow. Then they decided to try to make it look like an accident. So they were putting her into bed when Walter wakes up, and Roy explained to Walter that his wife had had a nightmare and that he should just go back to sleep. I'm just putting Dorothy back to bed. She had a nightmare. Wow. He's putting his dead wife next to him. How do you make a... A pillow suffocation looked like an accident. I, I guess they wanted it to seem like maybe she died in her sleep or okay. whatever. Oh, yeah. The next day, Mr. Scott Elliott went to his club for lunch, and Roy, Mike, and Mary tried to decide what they were going to do next. They thought that if they kept the old man sedated with his normal quota of pills, then Mary could impersonate Dorothy, at least for a little bit. Okay. So they give him whiskey and... And sleeping pills. He's 82 years old, and he already has dementia. Wow. And they're giving him whiskey and sleeping pills. Yeah, that's not good. So Mary puts on a wig, and she wears Dorothy's clothes. And according to one source, she went around to banks in London in her mink coat, in Dorothy's mink coat, withdrawing lots of money from the Scott Elliott's bank accounts. Wow. 
But Dorothy's from India, and Mary is from Belfast. And I've seen the pictures of these two. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. The next problem they had was to decide what to do with her body. Mm -hmm. So the next day, Roy hired a Ford Granada car. The registration VGE-999R from a firm called Godfrey Davies in London. Okay. Roy pretended he was the godson of Dorothy. Mm. And Mike pretended he was the chauffeur. And Mary still pretended that she was Mrs. Dorothy Scott Elliott herself. Mm. They put the body into the boot of the car. That's the trunk, if mm. you don't know. I used to drive a little convertible Mini Cooper, and I had to learn that there was the boot and the bonnet. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> they put the body in the boot, and that evening they took Mr. Scott Elliott to a cottage in Scotland 400 miles away that Roy had rented. Now, Mary sat in the back with Walter with a wig on her head, and she's wearing Dorothy's fur coat, and they all drive north to this house that Roy has rented under the name of Robin Thompson. Okay. The next day, they drove about another 125 miles further north into the middle of Scotland. They had lunch at a hotel, still with her body in the back of the car. Then they dumped Dorothy's body by a lonely roadside in Comrie, Perthshire. Mm. And now that they've gotten rid of the body, they drove back to the cottage and they left Walter there with Mary, Mr. Scott Elliott there with Mary, mm -hmm. still posing as his wife okay. while they returned to London and ransacked the house. Mm. So they ransacked this house before they leave. Then they go back again. Then they picked up Walter and Mary and continued their drive north to the Tilt Hotel in Blair Athole. <laughs> What'd you call me? <laughs> Where they stayed overnight. The athole <laughs> is Roy Fontaine. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's actually the name, Blair Athole. That's so unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where do sorry, you live? The pe sorry, people of Blair Athole. I'm sorry. <laughs> where do you live? <laughs> athole. <laughs> Would you call me? Athole. <laughs> The next day, on the 14th of December, 1977, after stopping off for a drink, Roy and Mike decide it's time to get rid of the old man. Mm. So when Walter Scott Elliott was on the side of the road taking a bathroom break, they attempted to strangle him. Now, I don't know if it was because he was caught off guard or he had that, like, strength that, you know... A sudden burst of energy. Yeah, or... from his dementia where he's ready to fight anybody. The adrenaline kicked in. But he fought back with unexpected strength. Yeah. And they had to use a spade to beat him uh, to death. Wow. And then using the same spade, they buried his body in a shallow grave. They didn't realize at the time, but they were spotted walking back to the car by a local girl. Oh, now, the next day, things were really tense between Roy and Mary. She wanted to keep Dorothy's mink coat, hmm. but Roy wanted to get rid of all the evidence. And these two fight, and then Mary and Roy end up having sex on the mink coat in front of a fire, and he changes his mind for a wee little bit <laughs> yeah. about what he wants to do to Mary, Okay, but it doesn't last long. When they got back to the cottage, another argument breaks out, and it was two against one. The men wanted her to get rid of the coat, and she wants to keep it. And in a fit of anger, Roy hit Mary over the head with a poker, fireplace poker, wow. and then suffocated her with a plastic bag before dressing her in men's clothes and wrapping her in a plastic sheet, dumping her in a stream under a bridge in Dumfrieshire. Wow. It's like Goodfellas stuff. It is. They go back to the Scott Elliott's house one more time. Not very smart because they've been away for a little bit. Yeah. And they take even more stuff. Mm. Now, the police are already looking for them. Okay. Because they had tried to sell stuff in Newcastle. He was suspicious. The owner of the store was suspicious mm -hmm. because these two men offered him silverware and china mm. that was well below its worth. Gotcha. So he jotted down the number plate of the car the guys were driving, and he alerts the police. Mm. And the police found the car had been rented out to a Scott Elliott. And when they visited the Chelsea flat that belongs to the man's name, 
Right. They found that the walls were spattered with blood uh. and over 5,000 pounds worth of valuables were missing. Wow. I think it was way more than 5,000 pounds. Yeah, yeah. But by then, Roy and Mike Kitt are on the move again. They went to Roy's family's place in Cumbria for Christmas, and when they arrive, Roy discovers that his half-brother Donald has been released from prison just three days before. Okay. Now, Donald, just like Roy, had a criminal record for burglary, but he also has a record for child molestation. Mm. And Roy hated him for this and thought he was a pervert. Yeah. And Donald hated his brother for being bisexual. <laughs> No love lost there. These two brothers hate each other. There's a lot of hating going on. Meanwhile, on Christmas Day, Mary Coggle's body is found by a shepherd. Wait, wait. <laughs> a shepherd on Christmas Day? <laughs> you have got to be making this up. <laughs> I'm not, but okay. that's the first. I just now made that connection, you pointing it out to me. <laughs> and there was a North Star. And there was no North Star. <laughs> there was nothing holy about this. Oh, my gosh. Okay, go ahead. But since Mary had worked for Walter Scott Elliott mm -hmm. and his wife Dorothy as a cook and a housekeeper, police are like, uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Well, there's something here. Yep, let's connect the dots. Back at Roy's family's place, Donald is asking too many questions while Roy and Mike Kitt are planning the robbery of Lady Margaret Peggy Hudson. Mm. And Donald's all about their newfound wealth, and Roy decided his brother's got to go. <laughs> oh, man. So there was a discussion about how they were going to tie up Lady Hudson, and they asked Donald if they can tie him up to practice. Oh, jeez. And they do. Hey, Donald, um, important safety tip. <laughs> Don't let anybody tie you up. Yeah, when you know that they're known criminals. And yeah. when you know your brother hates your guts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah probably not a good idea. They chloroformed Donald until he was dead. And then, just to make sure he was good and dead, they submerged him in the bathtub. Wow, that'll do it. I read in one source it was the first death by chloroform that they had. Oh, really? Yeah, in oh. the UK. Wow. The next day, on January 15th, 1978, they're out driving again. They're going north, and they're looking for somewhere to dispose yet another body. <sighs> They throw Donald in the trunk and off they go. So if you're keeping track at home, he's murdered David Wright, mm -hmm. both Walter and Dorothy Scott Elliott, right. Mary Coggle, right. and now his half-brother Donald, all in the span of six months. Wow. So they're trying to sell some of the goods that they've stolen from Walter and Dorothy, and Roy thinks that the numbers on the license plate are bad luck. Remember it was 999 on yeah. the license plate? Yeah. So they switch the plates on the car. And they start driving to Scotland saying they're going to immigrate to Australia. Hmm. Sorry, Australia. They were headed your way, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So it's the 15th of January. It's been snowing super hard, actually like blizzard conditions. Mm -hmm. And the ground was so frozen that they couldn't break ground to bury Donald. Gotcha. So they just decide to leave him in the trunk of the car and go to a hotel in North Berwick. Okay. And the hotel proprietor is suspicious about his two new guests. Right. And he didn't think they were murderers. Like, they check in, they get a room, then they're sitting in the bar drinking, and he's sort of watching them. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I'm, you know, he didn't think that they were murderers. He was more worried that they weren't going to be able to pay their bill. Uh. So he calls the local police, and he asks them to check out their car registration. Yeah. Okay. And remember, they've got false plates. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And okay. this is going to be his downfall. Right. So when the license plate number was checked, it was found that it should belong to a Ford Escort and not the Granada that they were driving. Mm. So two policemen appear at the hotel and ask them to explain this, explain yourselves. Right. These two are taken back to the police station. They question them separately. Okay. And Roy asks to go to the bathroom where he flushes anything in his pockets that might be incriminating. He flushes it down the toilet. Right. And he escapes out the window. <laughs> but his freedom is short-lived. He was picked up later in a taxi on his way to Dunbar. And at this time, they hadn't even looked in the trunk of his car to right. find Donald, right? Right. So Roy's on the lam. He gets a ride from this taxi driver who drives him around for three hours. 
And Roy uses the story that his wife had had an accident, but he didn't know which hospital she'd been taken to. Okay. So he's driving around for three hours, and the police are searching for him. Right. Finally, they set up a roadblock. Taxi pulls up. Roy is arrested. By the way, he did pay his full taxi fare. He actually <laughs> insisted on paying his taxi fare. Bless his heart. Bless his heart. <laughs> he might be a murderer, but he's a gentleman. There you go. Wow. And when they're taking Roy back to the police station, he swallows some pills that he had kept. They take him to the hospital. The police had searched the car and finally found Donald's body in the trunk. Mm. Mary's body had been found, obviously. And then the disappearance of Mr. and Mrs. Scott Elliott was being investigated. Okay. Roy breaks down when he's being questioned. He makes a full confession, even saying, yeah, there's a guy named David Wright, too, that's buried in Scotland. Jeez. At Kirkle House. He yeah. just coughed it all up. Coughed it all up. Wow. And he even insisted in helping the police find Walter's body mm. on the Highlands. Mm. And when they did get to him, I read that he had been chewed up by foxes uh. and was stuffed behind a rhododendron. Uh. Yeah. Days later, they dig up David Wright, and soon after, they found Dorothy Scott Elliott face down in a roadside ditch 100 miles from where they uncovered her husband, Walter. Wow. Now, during the trial in Edinburgh, it's May of 1978, right. Roy was described as a psychopath. <laughs> he makes a full confession to the five murders, and the British and the Scottish courts sentence him to life in prison. Okay. Roy then attempts suicide several times while he's in custody. And in 1999, he wrote his autobiography, A Perfect Gentleman, and said that there was, quote, a side of me when aroused that is cold and completely heartless, end quote. Wow. I don't think he had to be aroused. Yeah. 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 I just think that's his second nature. Yeah. He died of a stroke in 2002 in Kingston Prison in Portsmouth. He was 78 years old. And by this time, he was one of the oldest of the more than 70,000 prisoners in British prisons and the oldest to be serving a whole life tariff or a life sentence. Mm. He said, quote, I can't feel anything for killing these five people, not even remorse, end quote. Really? Yeah. And when wow. he was sentenced, the judge said to him, quote, Having regard to your cold-blooded behavior and undoubted leadership in these dreadful matters, I recommend that you shall not be considered for parole during the rest of your natural life, end quote. Good. Even as he is sentenced, Archibald Roy Fontaine <laughs> was dressed to the nines and he carried off this air of superiority while he was in court. Wow. He wanted to be a gentleman to the end. Yep. In 2005, British actor Malcolm McDowell and Hollywood screenwriter Peter Bellwood announced that they were seeking a director and funding for a film based on... Roy. Roy's right. life, yeah. Nothing ever came of it, but I could definitely see Malcolm McDowell oh, playing yeah. the role of, of Roy Fontaine. Yep. As for Mike Kiddo, well, he got 15 years, served his time, and he was released. Nobody knows what happened to him after that. Mm. Probably the best thing. Yeah. But Archibald Hall, a.k.a. Roy Fontaine, wanted so desperately for his life to be like that of a Hollywood movie. So he penned two books, The Wicked Mr. Hall and The Perfect Gentleman. I read The Wicked Mr. Hall. He loves to talk about his sexual escapades. And, of course, some of it you have to take with a grain of salt because sure. he did have three commitments to the psych unit. <laughs> right, right. He leaves all of that out of his books. Right. But he wanted this Hollywood life and this Hollywood ending, and unfortunately, he died in prison, a place he really didn't want to be, as evidenced by him sending a letter to the Observer in 1995 requesting the right to die. Really? Yeah. Wow. So he makes these suicide attempts. He, he, like, makes this plea to the media that he wants to die, and instead, he just has to suffer there until he has a stroke at the age of 78. Wah. But that is the story of Archibald Hall, a.k.a. Roy Fontaine, the killer butler. <laughs> the butler did it. Yep. And that's all I have to say about that. Well, Mr. Fontaine, it sounds like you got exactly what you deserved. Yeah, Roy Fontaine is way sexier than Archie Hall. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. 
What a life, though. Yeah. What, what a life. What a story. Yeah. What length some people will take just for fame. And, what a con and, man. Oh, yeah. Ridiculous. You know, he wants he wants the life of the rich and famous. Don't want to work for it, though. Yeah. So let's just steal it. Yep. Yep. Well, you know, people like that will spare nobody's emotions or feelings or anything to get what they want. It's true, but just think about all the people that he rubbed elbows with. Yeah. Like royalty and, I mean, people from the West End and, and yeah, it's crazy. Hollywood even. And he couldn't he couldn't not just be under the radar. He no. He had to be in the limelight. And when he's, when he's with um, Elizabeth Taylor, all he can think about is stealing her ring. Yeah. 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 Well, well... As opposed to him, I've got three people that, you know, really tried to stay under the radar, but they couldn't. <laughs> With this week's Bless Your Heart. Well, bless your heart. All right, number one, I'm calling this. Oh, you thought I was serious. Okay. Okay. A bungling robber who tried to pretend a holdup was a joke after he was recognized has been jailed. Wait, they're like, I know you. Yep, Lewis Hamilton. Just kidding. Yeah, Lewis Hamilton, 24, hit his face with a scarf as he held up the pub he had been fired from 13 days earlier, <laughs> brandishing a six-inch knife. But when his scarf slipped and he was recognized by his former boss, Holly McDonald, he told her, oh, don't worry, I'm only joking. They'll he, never know. They'll never know. Exactly. He then attempted to claim he was simply returning his uniform despite not having his former work outfit with him. Uh, and, yeah. In a final desperate bid to cover up the botch break in, the shameless thief offered to split the money with Miss McDonald's, which she refused. Surprise, surprise. So he left and the police were called. So... If I got this straight, he comes in, mask, knife, mm -hmm. this is a stick up, give me everything out of the drawer. She does it. And then she was like, I know you. <laughs> and then he says, I'm just kidding. It's just a joke. Don't, don't take me I'm serious. I'm here to bring my uniform back, but I don't have it with me. And she's <laughs> like, I'm calling BS on that. And, he, and then he says, okay, well, you can have half of what I just took from you. <laughs> right. So when he appeared at court, when he finally got to court, he got two years jailed after he admitted to the aggravated burglary. <sighs> yep. Yep. You get two years for being stupid. <laughs> yeah, I should have gotten five. <laughs> All right, number two. I know a good deal when I see it. I do, don't I, honey? You do, you do. <laughs> a Stradivarius violin, which thieves tried to offload for 100 pounds. What? Which is about $125 in U.S. dollars. Sold at auction yesterday for 1.4 million pounds. What? <laughs> yep. The instrument was stolen at London's Euston Station, and I hope I pronounced that right. Okay. Three years ago, while its owner was in a cafe, prompting a police lengthy investigation. So he, like, left his Stradivarius all alone? <laughs> no, he was in there, and I guess, you know, I mean, it's like anybody else. You have a bag or whatever, you set it down beside you. Oh. And somebody swiped it, yes. Don't set down your Stradivarius. Okay. It was it was eventually recovered, right? Unscathed and was sold today by Fine Instrument Auction House in an online sale for one million three hundred eighty-five thousand pounds, or in U.S. dollars, one point seven six nine million dollars. Wow! Yeah. Owner Min Jin Kim had played the violin, crafted in 1696. Oh, gosh, yeah. that breaks my heart. I know. <laughs> Since she was a teenager, but in its absence, she acquired a replacement. Uh, Another one, Strat? I, I don't know what uh, type of violin that she got, but it wasn't a Stradivarius. But at one stage, the thieves attempted to sell it, not far from where it had been taken. Yeah. For around 100 pounds or $127. Can you imagine if you're the person who bought it yeah. for $127? And why couldn't it just be get why couldn't she get it back again? That's hers. It was stolen property. Well, she probably got the insurance money for it. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And finally, number three, you had me at undies. You had me at what? Undies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> as far as criminal careers go, this one was pretty brief. Oh, but yeah. I'm bumped. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Dumb criminal Michael Moynihan 
was nabbed thanks to his blue and yellow underpants that poked above his low-slung trousers as he raided a store with, here it is, a machete. Pull your pants up, boy. Yeah. You can't wield a machete and look like you're a tough guy yeah, with if undies. your pants are down around your knees. Police studying CCTV of the robbery noticed the distinctive wife runs and an eagle eye officer later spotted them as he wandered around the city and then busted in. <laughs> Change your underwear too, dude. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The 22-year-old had dumped the clothes he had wore for the raid, but kept the same undies on. Yeah, gross, dude. Yep. And he is now spending his days in prison after being jailed for three years. And they took that underwear away from him. Yeah. Moynihan admitted to the robbery when he appeared in court. He had made off with $159 after threatening the staff with the machete. <laughs> Robin Bogue, defending attorney, said Moynihan had raided the store in October to pay off a drug debt oh. and insisted he will use his time in prison to gain qualifications. Qualifications. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's time served. Can you imagine, you know, like you're sitting in jail, you're eating <laughs> yeah. dinner and they're like, what are you in for? What are you in for? Yep. Yeah. Judge Arthur Dean told the robber his guilty plea saved him a five year stretch. He added the robbery was not sophisticated indeed and it was inept. It is clear you are not an articulate man, but you seem determined to put your past behind you. So at least he gave him that much. Behind you, but I'm bunch. <laughs> that was good. I didn't even think about that. I missed that. Dang it. <laughs> oh, well. I caught one. Yeah. So there's your bless your hearts. Mm -hmm. You're sitting in, in jail and you're like, I'm here because they recognized my drawers. <laughs> exactly. What are you in for, dirty undies? Yeah, wearing the same <laughs> pair of underwear. That's it. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Oh, boy. Well, bless his heart. I know. I know. <laughs> well, if you have a bless your heart or you know somebody's heart who needs blessing, all you got to do is go to hitchtohomicide.com. There's a pull-down menu, and while you're there, you can also suggest a case mm -hmm. or tell us about your brush with true crime. Yep. That's all we have today. That's my amazing husband out there. And that's my beautiful bride in the booth. I'm so glad I got to do a case where the butler did it. <laughs> he did do it <laughs> several times. Join us next time on Hitch to Homicide. <laughs> Bye, y'all.